So anyway, the the Old Testament reading for today is from Isaiah uh, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. And this is kind of talking about the people being gathered up from exile to be returned home. So that's why there's all the kind of gathering and collecting sort of language. So this is about a, a hope of return. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And the, the gospel reading is from the gospel according to Luke chapter two, uh, chapter three, starting at the, the 15th verse. So before this with Jesus, he's been born. Then we fast forward to when he's 12 years old. Then we don't hear from him again until just about now. As people will f- were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Here ends the reading. So today is the the day the church commemorates Jesus' baptism. So the the New Testament lesson is Luke's telling of Jesus' baptism. And today we're going to go through some points of interest in the lesson leading up to Jesus' baptism, and then we're going to talk about uh, Jesus' baptism and how it relates to us. So first we've got to talk about John the Baptist. Now, earlier on, Luke has told us that John is Jesus' cousin, and he tells the story about how John is born to Zechariah and Elizabeth in their old age when they'd long given up on ever being able to have children. But then we don't hear anything about John's childhood. But we catch up with him when he's around 30 years old and is preaching and baptizing up a storm and attracting people from all over. Now, John is a prophet, and one of the jobs of a prophet is to shake people out of complacency and call out injustice. So he's got a bit of a, a fire and brimstone flair to him, which uh, when we read it can make us feel a little bit nervous. Our lesson includes some of John's preaching, and the part that probably gets everyone the most nervous is the, the bit about the chaff being thrown into the unquenchable fire, which sounds very encouraging. Now, I know that sounds a a bit scary, but it's actually, there's some good news here. Because this lesson isn't, this uh, preaching really isn't about the chaff being burned so much as it is about the grain being saved. Now, none of us here are all good or all bad. 
human beings are jumbles of good and bad, immoral and moral, all mixed together. And Martin Luther talked about this by saying each of us is both a sinner and saint at the same time. So the best way to think about this uh, burning of the chaff is that it's a, a refining sort of fire rather than something like eternal punishment. It's a fire about burning away all the worst so that only the best remains. I think most of us have parts of ourselves we don't necessarily like or wish weren't there, actions we've taken we wish we could undone, we could undo, hurts that won't heal, inclinations we regret. The good news of this passage is that a day will come when those things will all be burned away and will be fully who we're called to be. Basically, what John is preaching is that, with, is that we, with the help of God, have the capacity to be better and to be turned around. Now, besides preaching, the other thing John is doing is baptizing. Now, Judaism does have a practice of like ritual bathing after certain life events, and ritual bathing purifies ritual impurity, which is different from like moral impurity. Ritual, ritual impurity doesn't have any moral implications, and most Jews in Jesus' day spent all of, nearly all their time in a state of ritual impurity. But to worship in the temple and do certain functions as a priest and a few other things, one would need to take like a, a ritual bath beforehand. It's almost like a, a gesture of respect and a way of preparing yourself. John, on the other hand, was concerned with moral impurity. And the baptism he offered was about giving people the opportunity to turn away from their sins and reorient themselves in a new direction. It was a ritual to recognize a new start. And the other thing that made John's baptism different from ritual bathing is that with a bath, you generally wash yourself. But with a baptism, someone baptizes you. You don't self-administer it. It's a grace that's given to you. And this sort of second chance made people flock to John. It's the same sort of hope many of us have when we start a new year. It's the hope of a new beginning. Now, this, all this popularity made people wonder whether John was the Messiah. And all the Gospels emphatically say, no, John is not the Messiah. And this is likely because uh, there were and still are people who believe John the Baptist was the Messiah was the Messiah. They're called Mandeans. It's a very small religion now, but uh, at the beginning of the church, the church was also small. So you got to remember, they're kind of a little bit in competition with each other. But I was fascinated to find out that this group of people still exists in kind of like the Iraq general area. So after Luke tells us some of John's preaching, we're told Herod imprisons John because John had rebuked Herod regarding Herodias. Now, what Luke doesn't exactly tell us is what this rebuke was about, but it's likely because the Herod Herodias situation was essentially the Clinton Lewinsky scandal of this decade of first century Israel. Everybody would have known about it. So, one thing that I didn't realize for a very long time reading the Bible, like 20 years, is that there are actually multiple rulers in the New Testament named Herod. The Herod uh, who was around when Jesus was born was kind of the, the OG Herod, the original Herod, and he's known as Herod the Great. And then he has a bunch of kids and grandkids, many of whom are also named Herod. So when Herod the Great dies shortly after Jesus' birth, his lands are all split up among these kids and eventually the grandkids. So the Herod mentioned in this lesson is actually a grandson of Herod the Great, and he's often called Herod Antipas. So we know who Herod is in the lesson, and now we got to get to Herodias. So Herodias is actually a great-granddaughter of Herod the Great. And her initial marriage was to a grandson of Herod called Herod Philip, who is the half-brother of Herod Antipas. Now, that sounds a little incestuous, and um, it's a little less incestuous than it sounds in that Herod the Great had multiple wives, so it wasn't like necessarily full cousin. It was a lot of like half-cousin, half-uncle sort of things. But uh, 
That was a feature of the family, and we haven't gotten to the scandal part yet. <laughs> so the scandal was Herod Antipas and Herodias are married to other people, but they decided that really wasn't doing it for them. So they each divorce their spouses and marry each other, meaning Herod Antipas had essentially stolen his half-brother's wife. So in Jewish law, you can't marry the divorced wife of your brother. So this was a, a giant scandal. People in Israel were really against this marriage between Herod and Herodias. And obviously, John was against this marriage as well and spoke out against it, which resulted in his imprisonment. And on top of that, everyone's all related to each other already with like cousin marriage. I looked at a family tree and I was like, wow, <laughs> this seems complicated. So John speaks out against this, and he's shut up in prison. Now, the UCC Statement of Faith has a line that says, we're called into the church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship. And John's situation here is a good reminder that doing the right thing isn't often the easiest thing. We often want a, a world where good things happen to good people, but that's not always how things play out. Sometimes speaking truth to power and calling out injustice has a real cost. And John paid for doing what was right with his freedom and eventually with his life. Now, many of the people who fight for justice in the world pay a heavy cost. Just off the top of my head, thinking about civil rights leaders or abolitionists or women who fought for suffrage, people fighting for justice are often imprisoned, ostracized, or assassinated. But in many cases, the foundations those people built did so much for those who came after them. And even if the way of justice is hard, there is joy and hope in knowing that you're making the world a better place. So after we're told John is imprisoned, Luke very passively notes that Jesus is baptized without mentioning John again. Now, there seems to be a thing that where early Christians were a little uncomfortable with the fact that Jesus was baptized by John, which uh, some people could interpret as meaning that John was more important than Jesus. So many scholars think Luke is trying to downplay John's role in Jesus' baptism because of this discomfort. Matthew and Mark are much more matter of fact about John being the one to baptize Jesus. But in addition to John kind of losing the, the top billing spot in Jesus' baptism, another thing unique to Luke here is that Jesus is baptized among everyone else who came to the river that day. Jesus is baptized among all the people, among those he came to save. And this highlights Jesus' role as our God with us and also his solidarity with humanity. <laughs> So Jesus' baptism marks the beginning of his public ministry. Uh, before this, he seems to have been living a relatively normal life that we don't have any record of. But when he's around 30 years old, he goes to John to be baptized and then starts going from place to place, preaching and teaching and performing miracles. And while he's doing that, he's out in the world among all sorts of people, rich and poor, sinners, saints, prostitutes, fishermen, tax collectors, people who are well-respected, and people who are the lowest of the low. So Jesus being baptized among all the people who came to John seeking a new beginning and a second chance, this foreshadows the ministry Jesus has ahead of him, which is a, a ministry of proclaiming the worth, value, and dignity of every sort of person. Now, the part I find most striking about Jesus' baptism is God's voice from heaven declaring to Jesus, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. It almost makes me think of like a, a proud parent shouting out, that's my boy. There's something really sweet about the scene. And it's an affirmation from God that confirms Jesus' identity and confirms that he's loved which likely helps center Jesus and prepare him for the work he's got ahead. Now, our baptisms are, are a bit different than Jesus, but baptism for us is still about God's love for us and our identity. 
Baptism is the sacrament where we officially welcome people into the family of God. And it's also about declaring and affirming that our ultimate identity is we are children of God. The earliest confession of the church and confession at baptism was Jesus is Lord. And that's a declaration that all the earthly powers and rulers that vie for our allegiance are not where our ultimate identity or allegiance is. We belong to God, and no one can ever take that away from us. The beginning part of the Gospel according to John uh, says that Christ gives us power to become children of God, which is a way of saying that through Christ we're all adopted into God's family. Now, this is why we use kinship language in church, like, like brother and sister, And baptism is an official recognition of that adoption. Now, at Christmas and in the holiday season we've just come through, our culture places a great deal of emphasis on the family and also pressure to have the perfect family with the perfect Christmas gathering. And this can make it an especially kind of difficult time for people who are part of families who don't match the idealized Norman Rockwell pictures of what society says the perfect family looks like and is like. And I think if we're honest, uh, pretty much everyone's family doesn't quite match that picture. And the good news for all of us is that regardless of what our families look like or are like, we're all part of God's family, which is the oddest family out there. The children of God and our siblings in Christ are every sort of person in every shape and size from every place, from every possible family configuration. And the church, the family of God, only functions because we're not all the same. It's our differences that give us different skills and passions and knowledge and insights that enable the church to work. God's family is all about celebrating how different and diverse people can come together and live God's love in the world. Now, scripture teaches that the reason we can love and be loved is because God loved us first. And God's love for us was so strong that God decided to dwell among us and experience all the sorrow, joy, and love that human life can hold. And through Christ's teaching, life, death, and resurrection, He showed us the depth and power of God's love. And it's God's love that makes any sort of family possible. So no matter what our families look like or are like, we're united through God's love and are all together part of God's perfectly imperfect family. Amen.